Too often, the media focuses exclusively on the violence and tumultuous actions of bad actors during crisis that, crises that occur daily around the world. And with clickbait exploiting negative social events for the sake of increased ratings and revenue, there are few incentives for media outlets to focus on the good that is happening in the world right now. Even media channels dedicated to peace building and sustainable development remain focused on the ills of corruption, war, and conflict rather than the efforts of peace builders within those conflicts. But peace talks too. And with this show, the voice of peace will be amplified. Mr. Rogers is often quoted in saying that when crisis strikes, look for the helpers. This show intends to do just that. Every day, right here in Vermont, there are thousands of engaged citizens actively building peace. We plan to amplify their efforts and we seek to develop a platform where peace builders all over the state can connect with each other across social boundaries and industry sectors to collaborate for the benefit of our collective community. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Peace Talks. And today we are meeting with Mr. Rajni Eddins. He is a poet, a community organizer, and he is currently serving Burlington as the Director of Cultural Empowerment with the Racial Justice Alliance of Vermont through the Richard Kemp Center, the first black-owned community center in the history of Vermont. Rajni, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I am delighted and honored to have you as a guest on this show and to premiere uh, our efforts here in, in amplifying peace builders right here in the state. So let's just kick it off by kind of, you know, tell us what does, what does being the director of cultural empowerment uh, mean in this community and how are, you, how are you engaging in that space? Definitely. Well, first of all, I wanted to begin by thanking you for holding space and using your um, and this platform to elevate and affirm and emphasize the need for peace in the world. I think we all have to be co-collaborators and co-creators towards that pursuit, towards that end. Um, of course, peace cannot necessarily um, manifest itself fully without the needs of human beings being met. So my director capacity um, as a director of cultural empowerment has to do with meeting the needs of people of African descent in this area. As we know, Vermont is a very homogenous space. So not always do we have the opportunity to have ourselves reflected in positively life-affirming and integrity-based ways that show up as soul-nourishing and crucially um, respectful and reverential um, in regards to our human personality. So I think that's uh, more of my primary role to serve that needs, uh, uh, those needs in in terms of youth development and an overall affirmation of the people. And what, what does that look like, like on a daily basis? Like, you know, what are, what are some of the primary activities that you're really focused on when you speak about meeting the needs of the BIPOC community here in Burlington? Well, I think BIPOC is misleading. It's, a, okay. it's more of the, it's, it's a, another more of the recent um, terminologies that kind of shortcut uh, the specificity of, uh, of addressing and aligning with people's needs and uh, and and true uh, beingness. When we're speaking about Black people, um, of course, you have not just a uh, monolithic group of people, but uh, the origin of human civilization is so vast. Uh, from Africa to the present, the entire human race stems from African people. Mm. Uh, so the the origin of that uh, biogenetic diversity that all people stem from, that vast uh, descendancy of people and our role in the world is so key. Sadly, because of the aftermath of colonization, genocide, and conquest, and white supremacy, a lot of that has been uh, relegated mm. to uh, an external or periphery-based uh, attention. Mm. Uh, and so my role more so is to use my art form as a way to encourage people of African descent to raise the consciousness of uh, human family in, in general. Uh, so we hold spaces for the Black Artist Showcase. We are taking a group of black youth in April to go to the African American Museum. You know, 
um, in terms of being based here in Burlington and Vermont proper, uh, youth of African descent, whether born on the continent or any um, aspect of the diaspora, don't often get a chance to see themselves reflected mm. in positive ways and learn about our key uh, contributions and experiences in history that can really uh, play a key role in contextualizing the way that we see ourselves in the world, what we've done, what we've been through, what we still must do. Uh, so I think that's key. We're also involved in supporting the endeavors of the second iteration of the Black Indie Summit, BX 2023, where we will be bringing Dr. Angela Davis, uh, uh, the world-renowned revolutionary icon, as well as uh, the all-black ballet company Philodenko from Philadelphia to the Flynn Theater on February 25th and 26th. Um, and this is intention to be a yearly practice, a tradition that will be instituted so youth of the present and in the future to come will have spaces to see themselves reflected, to see the brilliance and beauty and heritage and history um, of black people um, seen and affirmed in holistic ways that are black led and seen through our own eyes where we have actual agency and autonomy over our own narrative. So my role as cultural empowerment director um, plays a number of roles from just everyday engagement with people, mm. learning about well, how people um, see and view themselves in the world, unpacking a lot of the conscious and subconscious uh, cultivated anti-black pathology in human beings to be able to deconstruct and, and arrive at a more reverential appreciation of our shared humanity from Africa to the present. Mm. So it's definitely a, <laughs> a daily yeah. um, a crusade. No, I, it's, it's uh, very powerful work and much needed in our world today. Uh, there's, there's just uh, a lot of uh, need to, to really amplify those messages and, and uh, find better ways for us to connect culturally and to, to create more understanding uh, with the folks that we surround ourselves with, right? And, you know, what, what really stuck with me with what you were saying was uh, talking about the Black uh, Artist Showcase and, you know, mentioning just like w where we've been, what we've gone through, and what we still must do. That, uh, that sounds just, uh, you know, that's a, that's a story for me, and that's something that's really uh, a, a powerful experience. I've been to a few of the Black Artist Showcases at the Richard Kemp Center, and they're phenomenal. Um, but y can, you, can you speak to that a little bit more? Like, uh, you know, when you talk about the Black Artist Showcase, what, what are artists doing in that space, and how do they use story to empower, to, to work f towards cultural empowerment? Well, I think it has a multiplicity of, um, of utilities. For one, uh, having the space curated by uh, black people ourselves um, gives us, uh, returns us to a certain space of agency in mm. arraying our own and deploying our own narrative and expression of ourselves artistically and creatively and uh, restores the freedom and the liberation of having that um, authentic power um, in terms of speaking life into our dreams through a vaster black imaginary that's not inhibited by the circumscribed and, and limited um, myopic viewpoints of uh, white su so-called supremacy and racism. So being able to see ourselves in our own eyes is key having a cathartic outlet to express all of the range of our human emotions is key. Being able to share that space intergenerationally and have youth um, who are still in the space of formative development mm -hmm. is key. All these things are microcosmic seeds in terms of uh, a, grounder, a grander foundation for uh, macrocosmic paradigm shift. So it's about starting uh, where we are, and holding space for our people's empowerment, uh, sincere love and appreciation, affirmation of us uh, across the diverse array of how we exist in the world and just holding space for that beauty uh, reverently and sincerely. That is, 
I'm just, I, I love that approach so much. Um, it, uh, it reminds me of one of uh, my favorite peace builders. Uh, his name is Johann Galtung. Uh, and he has written prolifically about, uh, you know, peace building in a variety of different contexts. What I'm thinking about right now is, is uh, Galtung's uh, approach to development, not just not just economic development, but cultural development and, and uh, the development of communities. And, uh, you know, this, this, idea, this notion about microcosmic seeds playing out on a macro scale uh, really kind of speaks to one of his uh, peace building theories where he, he speaks about development as unfolding. Now, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I wish I had the direct quote, but um, it, uh, it, he basically speaks about development as a process of unfolding that's organic and evolutionary. It's something that happens through positive feedback loops rather than uh, negative feedback loops, which is generally what we see in society today as some kind of negative uh, feedback loop that prevents something from moving in a direction and tries to steer uh, cultural and economic forces in another direction. So you look at development as unfolding and there's this great section where Galtung says, you know, uh, in everything uh, that, that is living on this earth, there's a latent code in the seed. Seeds grow into plants, plants grow into uh, trees, uh, and, and they evolve and, and share that code, that latent code that's inside of them uh, that has always been there. And the objective of folks that are trying to build development through uh, you know through this process is is not to try and dictate or direct how development should unfold, but simply allow those latent seeds to grow into the spaces that they're a part of. Uh, and it sounds like that's a lot of uh, the the similarities to what you're trying to do here with cultural empowerment in Burlington. Does that sound? Uh, am I speaking kind of on the same page here, or? Or, you know, uh, have I missed a few points? No, I think uh, there, there's truth in it. I think the unsheathing of those seeds with the focus and tension for peace and prosperity and, and freedom and liberation, uh, health and restoration, um, ab abundance and uh, wellness in, in community, um, regionally, nationally, and globally, is all part of that seed and part of this self-same intention. I think that often things get muddied because we're so taught to th see um, life in terms of polarities instead of a synthesis. You know, mm. as we, if we remember, you know, we just passed Dr. King's birthday recently. We had an event called uh, Reclamation of his uh, life, legacy, and meaning because so often he's relegated to the sound bites of I Have a Dream. but. But I think when we look at him with more nuance and how he spoke to the need to address the three evils of militarism, mm. poverty, and racism, how he spoke to us uh, as a human family having intertwined destinies, that's part of the same seed I speak of. Uh, if we understand our destinies are intertwined from Africa to the present, if we understand that white, the term white and whiteness itself is an invented uh, identity that was more so for the purpose of hierarchizing and justifying a more uh, insidious way to manipulate and exploit the majority of human beings um, by not allowing them to unify in strength and for the purpose of peace. Mm -hmm. Then we'll be able to act with more agency, wisdom, and clarity for our children's benefit and for those to come. Wow. Well, this is obviously a passion for you, this is this is really deeply rooted. Uh, I know that based on our past conversations, uh, Rajni, um, you know, you see this as something of a calling, as as uh, your purpose in life to step forward and bring this message uh, to the communities that you participate in. Um, and you know, I I know that poetry is a big part of that for you. I know that uh, you know, working as an artist using poetry. Uh, to, dis to disseminate these seeds and help to cultivate space for other artists and poets to do the same 
uh, is something that uh, you are doing a great job at. Uh, I, I know I showed up in uh, the uh, Burlington area about a, a year ago and uh, was doing my best to, uh, you know, arrive at open mics and uh, there wasn't a lot going on in this uh, post-COVID world, but there was Raj Nyedins showing up at every single open mic that I could find, uh, hosting events, creating that space, and giving uh, opportunity for folks right here to, to share their talents and to build that, that culture that we're talking about, uh, that culture of peace and, and development. Um, with that being said, I really want to just like dig into uh, your past for a little bit here. I, I want to, you know, I, I, I want to be able to share that story of like where, where did poetry come from for you? How did you get started? You know, what does that process look like? Well, yes, I, I do think um, that finding your purpose and your calling has a lot to do with being uh, self-curious, mm. um, with being able to think deeply upon what really brings you fulfillment and joy and enthuses you, you know, and it brings uh, a spring well of, of passion to the fore. And we, I think where you find that arriving um, and where it meets a need in the world is is your calling. And so uh, I found that I was fortunate to find that by the grace very early in my life. My mother was the founder of the first black writers group in the Northwest, known as the African American Writers Alliance. Huh. So she founded in 1991, wow. and I became the only child member at that time. Um, how old were you at the time? I was 11 years old, which is how old my daughter is now. Um, wow. She's an amazing poet as well. But um, I think being immersed in that space as a youth, having a mother who was already so based in uh, uh, solid appreciation of the power of, and potency of creative self-expression and had a passion herself and was led by a purpose to see black people have an autonomy-based um, foundation for our own creative self-expression and, mm -hmm. and being able to do that without being inhibited or relegated to some prop or fixture to make um, white organizations feel or seem less racist or some type of mm. exploitive effort. Having that, our own autonomy and agency and witnessing that as a child, wow. being immersed in a community was so rich with so many gifts from novelists to poets to playwrights to actors and directors and singers and songwriters, all of these amazing creative gifts and, and talents and um, so much vision and wisdom really fed my spirit in untold ways that activated me. And then I began to be received by my community, encouraged, or continued to be nurtured um, by my mother and others, uh, and fostered the gift and the love and appreciation for the possibilities of it and what it could do in the world. Wow. So it really sprang forth in me um, and set me upon my path at that juncture such that there's never been a time that I can recall since then that I haven't been active in some capacity with artistry and community because my mother was also a foster parent to over 70 children. Oh my goodness. So I was always the older brother. So that facility of engaging with youth in a familial capacity and using artistry as a way of nurturance and empowerment and positive affirmation and self-actualization of purpose are all intertwined we also co-founded a group called The Poetry Experience because I had so many peers um, who were gifted from a vast array of different ethnicities and backgrounds. So I think that that seemed uh, fitting in terms of origin story and sequence. As we know, we all begin with black people from Africa to the present. So starting with the African American Writers Alliance and then expanding to the poetry experience that was a welcoming platform for all people seemed um, a divine unfolding. Yeah, I was just thinking about that too, about, you know, development as unfolding. It seems like your mother uh, had a sense for this. Uh, you know, uh, if, we, if we kind of take that concept 
and apply it to this very practical experience that you're talking about, um, it seems very much like your mother gave you the space to unfold and develop in your own way. And, and uh, here we are now at this juncture, <laughs> and you're a community organizer, uh, you're creating space for others, and you're, you're giving people that same opportunity to unfold that latent code inside of each of us to become the, the very uh, incredible folks that, e that we can be. You know, I, I think that there is a powerful potential in every single person. Uh, and what generally prevents that from unfolding is, is the obstructions, the barriers in our, in our communities that, um, that uh, you know, act as negative feedback loops, right? You know, there's, there's social institutions, you know, some of which you've already touched on here. Um, you know, we look at uh, racism in America. We look at the uh, challenges of... Uh, structural uh, violence that that is enacted uh, within the system in those spaces um, and this seems to be uh, kind of a foil to those to those issues um, uh, and through a very organic process you know well, I don't even necessarily think it's uh, a, a foil, foil yeah, or, 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 or a counter I think it's similar to maybe it's a it's a Rumi poem or, or something okay of the Sufis but it speaks to not uh, all, all uh, it speaks to the necessity of, of ne not necessarily having to um, do anything more than remove the obstructions hmm. to love, remove the obstructions and the barriers to peace. So mm. it's, so I think it, our natural way is peace. A natural way is love. Uh, when we're held space for it in nurturing and nurturing and caring in passionate ways that speak to the light within all of us. That sense of namaste, like the, the light and the spirit within me recognizes the light and the spirit within you. Mm -hmm. I think too often because we've been so inundated with negativity, we're so quick to spring, to respond in a kind of Pavlovian dog-like manner to that bell of uh, embracing that the negative more often or assuming the negative to be true without deeply thinking critically and uh, having the more intentionality about seeing the light in ourselves and in each other and that's what I think that our imagination and creativity has the capacity for when you have that kind of childlike awe and wonder about the mm. world and the universe there are it's no powerful. limitations to what can be and you have much more possibilities in terms of what you can create in the world and in the universe. And I think that's why uh, there's some fear for a lot of the powers that be wanting, uh, are stemming very much from a uh, materialistic standpoint of wanting to accrue and aggrandize and accumulate uh, resources and hoard them at the expense of the masses. Uh, you have to have a definitive system in play to do so to be able to restrict people's imaginations and keep them from seeing greater possibilities in their unity and, and shared prosperity. But that's why I feel blessed to be an artist, because mm. very naturally so when we have access to limitless uh, imagination and yeah. creativity, we can be bridges and beacons for the like in ourselves and in each other. Beautiful. Um. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons I kept showing up at your open mics. I can feel that every time that you host an event or share a poem. Uh, it's it's uh, really, there's just a strong presence of this uh, kind of cultural development of peace and love and breaking through those barriers with our creative imaginations to shape something new in our community. Now, I did want, you know, I, I wanted to ask, have, have you faced any resistance or opposition to your poetry in this community? And, like, if so, how, how do you deal with that? You know, what, what, is the, what is your approach to responding to folks that are, uh, that are still trying to understand what we're doing here? Well, I think any resistance that you have in terms of people's willingness to view you negatively even while you address things in a positive manner and hold space for truth and conciliation and greater awareness um, for affirmation um, stems from woundedness. So mm. 
it doesn't necessitate the need to um, in, uh, reject the people who are rejecting. Uh, it just it seeks a deeper wisdom of involvement in the consistent practice of love, peace, and compassion for all present, and the holding of space for greater possibilities. I learned early on with a lot of the things that I was beset with in terms of character assassination, attempts to align me with tropes of black men, refusal mm -hmm. to connect to me as a human being and hold space for my own story, or even be willing to hear my uh, experiences. I think that because I stayed rooted in my love for myself, um, having that sound model of my mother holding a space for so many people, she had always yeah. said, children are treasure. So it let me know, as a child, I am treasure. Mm -hmm. And then as an adult, as a grown man, oh, we all are treasure. And those who are not as um, adept at seeing that readily, you have to know at some point they were wounded and they didn't receive the same things that you receive. So I have something, honestly, of more treasure than monetary or uh, material value because it's the, uh, it's the practice of embracing all people in a space where they are sincerely welcomed in love and appreciation, which is irreplaceable and of really increasingly um, vital need in today's times. So uh, I, I think in, in the long run overall, having had these experiences and still cleaving to a solid sense of myself in terms of sharing my yeah. art, even when it's harsh truths, it's coming from a place of love and recognition and belief in people's capacity to grow and to understand that we have uh, an intertwined um, purpose and destiny and that we're capable of more for our shared um, prosperity for that of our children and children to come has really enabled me to persevere in ways that I think align me with folks who have been examples in the past mm -hmm. and ancestors whose shoulders we stand upon who did so much in terms of self-sacrifice and honoring of our humanity before we were even born. Mm -hmm. So I aim to be a worthy um, descendant and uh, legacy builder so that I can be a good ancestor for those next to come. And it's less about who uh, gets that quickly in the moment than that it's done consistently in a committed fashion uh, such that it uh, continues to honor that practice and plant seeds in those here and those next to come. Beautiful. There's so much I would like to say, but I think something that's more important is uh, maybe maybe what would best express this this approach and 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 helping folks to understand the process of uh, you know engaging in our communities through art with uh, the the effort of cultural empowerment and collective unity um, you know building on that love and peace and creating uh, space for for those that are that have been wounded you know I, I really uh, want to just take a second and look at a couple of these books we've got in front of us. Now, uh, we've got uh, uh, two books here. Their names are mine, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I believe was published in 2019. That's right. And this is one of your books of poetry, right, Rajni? Yes, sir. Yeah, and then we've also got a brand new book that was published just a few years ago. Not, not, uh, not a few years ago. Last a year. Few, just last year, a few months ago. Forgive me, and this is In the Coded Language of This Mortal Tongue. Uh, I've had the pleasure of reading uh, through both of these books and uh, an even greater pleasure listening to Rajni perform some of these poems um, live at the, uh, the poetry open mics that, that I've attended with him. And I, I'd like to give you some space right now uh, if, if you're willing to maybe share one of those poems uh, and then we can speak about that for a second. Definitely. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. Please, yeah. uh, maybe I'll share um, something from the newest text uh, in the coded okay. language of this motor tongue. Uh, as you can see, uh, my, um, my mother is here. She's quite often uh, a pronounced figure in my life, so I wanted to give her her flowers while she is in the vessel and still live, lives amongst us in real time. Uh, the piece I want to share with you in terms of this uh, text is called In Our Wake. This was actually written um, 
maybe a, a week or two into the pandemic. I okay. just returned from okay. Seattle, Washington as I transitioned into full-time employment using my art as a way to uh, confront white supremacy and affirm mutual humanity in meaningful, impactful ways that hold space for people to deconstruct the social construct of race and to think more deeply about how we can uh, heal the suffering of black people and, and people collectively and inspire and encourage um, uh, all of us to find our purpose and calling in meaningful, impactful ways that speak to peace yeah. and love and, and, and shared prosperity. So this is a piece I know this was such a crucial time for myself and, and so many in the world, yeah. um, and that we are still reeling from it to this day. So that hopefully this will offer some inspiration and uh, encouragement in terms of the recognition that there is still more possible. So this is called In Our Wake. Inside these hands, a golden chance. Within these walls, a castle falls, while all the peasants dance. Where does one turn in a house of mirrors? If everywhere you look, there you are. If silence becomes too loud to hear over the bird songs. When touch seems a distant stranger, fuzzy and still wet with hazy memory. No one said anything about the masks we'd wear over the masks we wore before. And yet, the sun still shines through gloom, and flowers dare to bloom. I saw a patch of onion, a robin thrusting its chest out, eyed me suspiciously, as if to say, what are you doing here? Mm. It appears we are still here. Maybe we can outlive and outgrow our shadows. Maybe life will look us square in the eyeball and not notice our flinching imperceptibly, or see it and still forgive us our immortal mortalities. Maybe today will be the day the walls part like seas and the ceilings raise and the light has its way with us. Maybe the rain will merge with the sweat born of our contained lives and become indistinguishable. Maybe we'll take ourselves out of ourselves, cast away the plastic packaging and see something more alive, something more fun to play with than fear and shallow mirrors. Maybe we can be friendly to ourselves, even when the world is not watching. When the ceaseless eye of Babylon has gone to sleep or long died, we can be here, creating, musing, imagining, envisioning life as it could and can be, and leave what it was and is in our wake. Absolutely beautiful. I love that uh, the the bit about the mirrors. It you know, it, it sounds like uh, um, uh, kind of a metaphor for the Zoom world that we're all a attached to right now. Mm. Uh, at least that's the way that I was kind of interpreting that. In the midst of the pandemic, how many times do we find ourselves in front of a screen filled with tiny little mirrors and boxes, and there we are always. Uh, it's a strange phenomenon to have to look at ourselves digitally uh, as we en engage with others. Uh, and um, it's, yeah. it, it, anyway, I, I, found, I find that to be just a fascinating element of like, you know, there needs to come a time when we can step back and really, really look at ourselves through something less than a, something more than a shallow mirror. Yeah, right? I, I think so too. I think it, it can have that, um, that meaning in terms of referencing the disconnect in, uh, re regarding our, our forced uh, reliance on technology to engage. And it can also, I think, refer to how we can sometimes be uh, subject to uh, uh, acquiescence, to mm -hmm. have knee-jerk reactions um, uh, stereotypical perceptions and perspectives of people who are our reflections. Um, every person is your reflection. Every person has something to learn and something to teach. So when you circumscribe them to one-dimensional ideas, 
from past experiences that have nothing to do with the depth and nuance of who they truly are, you're in effect robbing yourself of access to the brilliance that is within all people. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we don't um, deprive each other of our mutual value because there's a shared wealth in that brilliance uh, amongst the collective of human beings that if we just hold space for curiosity and a willingness to learn and grow and see what we share in tandem and what differs in our stories, so much learning and, and beautiful things can be attained from that phenomenon and that in interaction and engagement. And it certainly is needed in the world where uh, so much history is based on the opposite, uh, where, where we're taught to have a quick, fast take on who people are and think yeah. that we know them before we even get a chance to know ourselves and or share each other's stories. Wow. Yeah, no. Uh, as the old adage goes, don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, that a little bit cliche for, for a, a conversation regarding poetry. But, uh, you know, what you're talking about here is so much deeper than that. And uh, even deeper than this idea of, you know, flat Zoom worlds, right? You know, what you're really talking about is uh, stepping back and, and, and pulling back that curtain, among, you know, for ourselves as well as for the people we interact with and really giving space for understanding, giving space to, to learn and to grow and to uh, give people the benefit that, you know, they have something valuable to offer. Well, I think what, what that willingness to, to be present and to share yourself and receive other people's self-expression and shared story authentically does is it, it takes us out of the programmed realm of, of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. It allows for a space for sincere care b and love and appreciation based on who we are and, and, and also allows us to have a more intentional, uh, hands-on approach about who we are allowing ourselves to become. Because hmm. I remember that's something that James Baldwin said too that was quoted I think in that movie Bamboozled uh, by Spike Lee about uh, the um, kind of the history of minstrelsy and how people still take to these stereotypes. But um, I think he said, uh, people um, pay the price for who, I'm kind of paraphrasing. That's okay. For who they, um, who they are, or for what they do and what they don't do. And even more so by who they allow themselves to become. And they pay very simply. Uh, with the lives they lead. So I think the whole terminology of whiteness, thinking that it's above, I think European people are conditioned to believe that white exists, thinking they're above, has robbed them of their own humanity in mm. terms of appreciating the richness of the world they exist in and mm. feeling some weird uh, or strange need to preserve something that's based on fabrication. that has nothing to do with their true essence, their true humanity, their true spirit, having the need to draw from so many different faiths and different ethnic backgrounds to attain spirituality, to have a kind of a buffet mentality about drawing from the cultural appropriation of other people's culture rather than residing in an uh, authentic place where you find your own centered um, presence and, uh, and a focus on the, the value in, in within. Yeah. I think that's what we can offer the world as artists and as human beings when we're heart-centered and we have that approach to hold space for ourselves and each other authentically. And there is where so much care, love, and peace can dwell. Yeah, no, um, what, you're, what you're really talking about and getting at for me, and this is something that you and I have fallen on in many occasions uh, in our past conversations. I've really enjoyed getting to know you better and getting to know your approach uh, to, you know, civic uh, engagement and, and uh, uh, trying to uh, address these very challenging issues directly. Uh, and, you know, like we're talking about with development as unfolding through Johan Galtung, um, you know, when we get into this aspect of 
of race and the concept of white supremacy, uh, you know, when you talk about, you know, they, that white folks, very much like myself, I think we're all on a journey of trying to understand that better, but, you know, of, of white folks robbing themselves of, you know, being something different, you know, of unfolding into something new. It, it speaks to Pablo Ferreri's uh, book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And, uh, you know, there's this uh, balance that kind of plays out in the first chapter of that book uh, where uh, Ferreri really dives into the relationship between the oppressed and the oppressor and how um, it, it doesn't matter what side of the equation you're on in that, in that space, uh, whether you're the oppressed or the oppressor, violence affects both sides, right? Uh, the, the one committing the violence is also hurt, is also bruised by those, by those events. And so, you know, when you're talking about creating understanding and acknowledgement and bringing truth to this space and, and allowing space for white folks very much like myself to, uh, to you know, acknowledge that and find alternative ways, it, it really speaks to that dynamic between the oppressed and the oppressor. And I'd love to maybe just end with, like, yeah, you know, asking how do you use your poetry to build peace in this space, you know, based on, on these kinds of uh, concepts that Ferrari is talking about? Well, I think that, as John Henry Clark said, uh, African history is the, are the, uh, the pages of African history are the missing pages of world history. So we're, we're, when you think about the term white, that has nothing to do with the true identity of human beings, but was rather something that's fabricated. What happens when people of European descent replace that term and think more deeply about how they play into different patterns and coded behaviors that have been intergenerational? What happens mm. when um, there is more leadership capacity held for black educators and educators of global majority to fill those gaps and lapses where um, spaces of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, which are maybe um, short-sighted when they're simply uh, held, held to be um, enacted by white women, white educators, um, and in terms of normalizing the, the, the concept of white supremacy in a new age and more contemporary fashion. Because if you're not allowing for the voices of the people who have been most adversely affected to take a leadership role, mm. then you still create the same patterns of the past. So I see that um, within the school district. I see that within uh, politics at large and civic engagements and the ways that um, we are positioning ourselves. But I think that if we as human beings hold space for a deeper listening to ourselves and to underheard voices, voices that have historically been suppressed or uh, repressed uh, while the people have been being oppressed, then we can find ways to um, outgrow these uh, circumscribed roles of oppressor and oppressed and think more deeply about how we have agency over transforming that paradigm, transforming yeah. the way that we engage and respect and have sincere reverence for our shared humanity and ways that reflect on the dignity of the human personality that Dr. King spoke of in ways that speak to the beauty and the brilliance inherent in every child and by the same token, all of us. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I wish we could talk for hours more, but uh, I think that uh, this, this episode is coming to a close and I just want to take a moment to remind you all who are listening to this and watching right now that peace talks and that there are many people in our communities today that are working to build peace despite the, the many crises and challenges that we are facing in this volatile world. Um, and with that, I just want to say this, this, uh, this show is being brought to you by Community Wealth Development, and uh, we're going to be talking to folks from various sectors of our community uh, that are building peace in wildly different ways. Uh, this this uh, episode is really focused on, uh, like we said, development as, un as unfolding, uh, really connected to art and humanity, and the opportunity to, to build new cultural spaces that allow us to understand and grow 
and unfold as we should be, as we should, with, uh, with peace in mind at the center of that. Um, following this episode, we'll likely be moving into uh, more um, economically based uh, developments, but also, you know, very focused on mission-driven actors that are trying to create access to justice, access to opportunity, uh, and, and generating uh, um, a collective effort in order to do so. So thank you so much for watching, uh, and you all have a wonderful day.